Hi again, everybody. Uh, I'm joining you again to talk to you about the Public History Project, which a lot of people have questions about. Hopefully, this walk through the assignment will answer a lot of the questions that you have uh, about what we're doing and where we're going with, with all of this. So, um, let's Let's get back into what I said at the very beginning of this class. History is the recording and interpretation of past human events. Public history is taking that historical approach and applying it to the context of the real world. Um, so, as I told you guys, you are going to organize yourselves into teams at each school. So, start high school. I might have three people over there. Well, if there's three people, I'm sorry about your luck. You're all going to be on the same team because it's going to be a team of two to four people. Woodward, there might be two of you. You're both on the same team. But let's say you're at weight and there's 16 people from weight in the class. Weight folks, you can kind of pick and choose groups that are between two and four people large. And you will, you'll complete several projects over at Waite High School. So you're going to be organized into these groups. Um, you are allowed to self-select into your groups with my approval. Um, some of you guys I know pretty well at this point. And if I sense a bad chemistry issue, I'm probably going to go, is this the wisest choice for all of our grades here? And hopefully you will agree with me. And if you don't, I will just tell you, no, you're not going to be in the same group. I'm probably not going to do that. I'm just throwing it out there uh, that you should be aware. So uh, as I said in the syllabus walk, um, as a group, you're going to spend the first three weeks of this class discerning what you want to do what trend, what event, what place, what personality um, of Toledo's history. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little further about what kinds of things those could be in here. Um, you will then extensively research your topic and ultimately create a product of public history about it. Now let me talk about the groups first because that's the first thing you're going to have to do. Um, so your roles in your group. Every team has at least two roles. Okay. Every team is going to have a lead historian and a lead designer. One of you is going to have ultimate responsibility for research. Another of you is going to have ultimate responsibility for design. Okay, and those are big jobs. And I really encourage you to think about, think about what you're best at. Are you the more artistic type or are you the bookish type that really likes to study and dive into things? Um, if you're both, well, God bless you. You're doing better than I am. Um, if you are neither, just pick which one you think you could do uh, a little bit better than the other. Now, groups with three or four people are also going to have two other roles. And I really encourage you to form groups of four when possible. Um, because I feel like a group of four breaks up the work a little bit more and makes this all a little simpler to do. So those other roles will be unit investigator and editor. Unit investigator will be the person in charge of tracking down primary source, pers source persons or subject experts to interview. Every one of your projects should be interviewing someone. Now, it may be the historical figure themselves. It may be their son or grandson or great granddaughter or something like that. Um, it may be somebody who knew that person. It may be a professor at UT or an author in town who's written about that. But you have to find a subject or an expert to interview. And in a group of three or four, the unit investigator is going to be that person in charge of hunting somebody up and being able to talk on the phone and, and sound good and, and be peppy and be excited and sell this person on what you're doing so they want to help you. Um, finally, editor. Another really important thing. Um, if this is public history, it's going to be in front of the public. And we don't want to get you know, caught looking like idiots because we misspell there, there, and there, um, or your, your, and your. We, we want to look smart with this, right? So uh, the editor is going to copy edit for grammar, punctuation, and style in all of the products created by the group. Every one of you is expected to shoulder an equal amount of this burden. Nobody should be working a lot harder than anybody else because they have to. If you want to, that's one thing, but you shouldn't be doing it because you have to. Everybody should be picking up this heavy object together. Um, and each of you is going to be required to evaluate the performance of other members of the group at every one of our checkpoints. So let's talk about checkpoints. Um, this is not something where I'm spinning you loose and you got to get the thing done and then oopsie daisy, we get to May and nothing's done. I will know if you're not done with this. 
So first of all, job number one is going to be one of our first jobs in this class, identifying our terrain. Where are we? A lot of us don't always know. <sighs> a lot of us don't always know exactly what our neighborhood is. Now, there's some neighborhoods where everybody knows, like on the east side, everybody knows from there when they're from Birmingham. Um, everybody knows if they're from the old West End. Everybody knows if they're from Old Orchard. But like, there's a lot of other parts of town where people are like, I don't know, I live on the east side. I don't know, I, I, I live in West Toledo. Like, people don't always know their neighborhood. So let's get a little more specific and know our neighborhoods and know our school's feeder patterns. I think it's really important to know where in the city do people come from to go to my school? So that's um, that's another thing that's that's going to be pretty important here. Uh, so identifying terrain is the first thing. What geographic area do we have to select something from? So then once you know your terrain, then you can start finding a topic. Now this is trickier because I'm asking you to find a great topic in Toledo history before we've actually done the history part of class. So what this is going to require you to do is go ahead into course materials. Go ahead in our Mosier Porter book. If you know you're interested in World War II, flip ahead to the World War II section in Mosier Porter and find a topic about Toledo and World War II. If you're into the Civil War, flip ahead to that. Civil rights, flip ahead to that. And try and find a topic that really speaks to you that happened in your neighborhood. Um, one of the other things I think is really, really critical and can be a really great source of information um, ask questions of longtime teachers in your building. Okay. So, uh, if you're at Woodward and you know, Mrs. Yenrick over there, Mrs. Yenrick went to Woodward. Uh, I'm not going to say a very long time ago, or she might hit me. Um, Mrs. W <laughs> Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Yenrick went to Woodward some time ago and she knows a lot about the Woodward area. She's a great person where if you said, hey, Mrs. Yenrick, I'm in Mr. Boyle's class and she knows me. She'll, she'll know what you're talking about. Mrs. Yenrick, I'm in Mr. Boyle's class. What, what's something I could do in the Woodward feeder pattern? What's a really interesting historical thing that happened here? Um, uh, if you're at start, Mr. Crosley knows a ton about that area. Mrs. Miss McClure knows a ton about that area. You can talk to one of them and say, hey, I'm doing this project about our feeder pattern, our area. Are there some historic things or people from our neighborhood that you think I could do? If you're at Wait, you got Murph, you got Mr. Deem, you got, geez, half the staff went to Wait High School. You, you can ask any of them about, about history on the east side or, or uh, South Toledo. If you're at Bowser, you got Mrs. Miss Wu, who's been there a very long time. Um, there is a retired teacher, Mr. Jewell, and I bet you could reach out to Mr. Jewell and he would have some amazing ideas because he's one of the best teachers I've ever met in my life. Um, if you're at Rogers, you've got uh, Miss Mills, who's been in the Rogers area forever. Mrs. Neely's been in the Rogers area forever. Um, uh, Miss Hawkins uh, graduated from Rogers. She can tell you all about the neighborhood. So there are a lot of people in your schools who would be great resources for you to go, I don't know what to do. Now, here's the thing. Who else would be a good resource? Me. But I'm not going to do that. Now, it sounds like a jerk move, right? Uh, thanks, Boyle. Thanks for nothing. I want you to get involved in the process of history. And if you ask me, I and, and I was going to give you answers, I would probably give you something that you would find so boring um, th that that you'd have no interest in it at all. I want you to get active with your communities. Now, other thing you can do outside of other teachers from your school, older people who have lived in your neighborhoods for some time. If you know somebody who lives four apartments down, who's been in your apartment building since the 1960s, this is a great time to uh, put on a mask, make some cookies and take them over and go, hey, Mrs. Smith, I'm doing this project for my history class at school. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about the history in our neighborhood. Great opportunity to do something like that. And old people love telling stories about the past. So I really encourage you to do that as well. Um, now, you want to research something, someplace, or someone for whom there will be adequate primary sources available. I will help you in discerning that. So for instance, if you wanted to pick a historic building in your neighborhood and you said, I want to do a project on my house. I am probably going to tell you, I don't think that's a great idea because 
you're going to have a really hard time finding historical records about your house. You might be able to find a deed. You may even be able to find building permits if you dug really, really hard. Um, you may be able to find property transfers, but you're probably not going to find much about your house unless you live in one of about a hundred really important historical houses in the entire city. Um, but if you're in your neighborhood and there's an old abandoned fire department building, it used to be a fire station and you want to do a history on that, we can probably talk about that. We can probably find something cool to do there. So you really need to kind of, an old church in your neighborhood that you want to do something on this old church or whatever, we can probably find a project to do there. Um, we can probably find something pretty interesting. So one of the things I, I will encourage you to do as you're thinking about topics, just walk around your neighborhood and look at old buildings. And if there's an old building that's cooler than the rest, it might make a good project. Um, now, other things would be events that happen in your neighborhood. So if you live up in the north, the Dempsey-Willard fight happened there in 1919. We'll talk about it in class and we're even gonna have a guest speaker on it. Dempsey-Willard fight is a heck of a story and would be a great event to do a project on. Um, you live over by Bowser, the Anthony Wayne Trail fire in the 1960s. Incredible event, incredible heroism shown by firefighters in that thing. Um, and there are a lot of people alive who remember it that you could interview. Great project. Palm Sunday tornado outbreak in the 1960s. Destroyed houses from Bowser to Woodward. Uh, the tornado outbreak could make a good uh, history project. The Jack Kennedy murder. No, not that Jack Kennedy, not the president. This is a different Jack Kennedy who was a gangster in Toledo. Uh, during Prohibition, and you could do a gangster project. That would be a really cool project. That's a historic event that happened close to where some of you live. All right, uh, historic buildings and historic businesses. So we talked about this a little bit already, but let's go into it a little further. It could be a business that's in your neighborhood and has been there forever. So Tony Pacos could be a good project for a group of you who live in Birmingham. Um, Libby Glass, you live over on the north, um, Libby Glass could be a great project because it's a business that's been around forever. Um, it could be an abandoned building, the Bayview Naval Armory up in the point. Really cool building with a great story. Could be a great project. Um, the Nasby building downtown. Great stories behind that building and it looks like garbage right now. Um, uh, it could be an old abandoned fire station in your neighborhood. Um, it could even be a place that doesn't exist anymore, like Ironville. And you'll learn a little bit more about Ironville uh, as we talk about neighborhoods in, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, it could be a historic person who came to your neighborhood, lived in your neighborhood, or was from your neighborhood. Um, there have been a lot of really important people who once called Toledo home. So Betty Ford, who was First Lady of the United States, the wife of President Gerald Ford, she lived in South Toledo for a while. Um, Ella P. Stewart, you guys, I, I can't even explain to you how important Ella P. Stewart is in American history and the fact that not only was she important, lots of other really important people came through her store and stayed there. They stayed up above the store in her guest room. It's, it's, it's really incredible. Um, women's rights activist Gloria Steinem, who is still alive, is from East Toledo. Um, there are many other Toledoans who came through and visited the city. And there is a great new book out right now by uh, the historical writer Ted Long called uh, Forgotten Visitors of Toledo and Lucas County. Highly encourage you to uh, pick that one up from the library. All the library branches have it now. Just came out in the past couple of months. And uh, Long's book is really, really good and could give you some ideas of people who came to your neighborhood. Um, even more compelling than these really famous people. And again, this is where you want to talk to the elders in your neighborhood. Um, Toledoans who did great things for the city and remain mostly anonymous. There are so many people who have served on city council and done great things for their neighborhood and nobody knows their name. They don't have a park named after them or a building named after them. They were really good people who did really good things for the city and we just forget about them. Um, mayors who have done great things, people who have been on the school board, people who have served as county commissioners, cops and firefighters and doctors and nurses and teachers and, and just all through the spectrum of, of things human beings can do. There have been some amazing people from this city. One thing you could consult for this would be your school's Hall of Fame. Every one of our high schools has a Hall of Fame, not just for athletics, but for like real accomplishments in the world. Not that athletics aren't real accomplishments. Um, 
But at Woodward, you've got a couple of nuclear physicists who worked on the atomic bomb. Um, at Bowser, you've got a lot of people who have gone into incredible uh, careers in medicine. Way High School, um, in the in the lunchroom, if you guys remember, way back when we went to lunchrooms, um, there's there's that entire wall of distinguished Wade alumni, and then there's a rack that you have to flip through to get through the rest of them. Uh, there are more than 150 distinguished Wade alumni. Every one of them has a story that's probably worthy of a probably worthy of a project. Um, so again, elders in your school, elders in your neighborhood, great sources to get ideas if you're going to do a personality. Identifying your topic is going to be due exactly one month from the first day of class, February 5th of 2021. That's when I need to know what your group is going to do. And um, once you're married to it, man, you are married to this and uh, divorce doesn't happen. Once we pick the topic, we're on the topic. Now, after that, you begin your research. Internet's going to help you get started, and you're going to fill out something called the basic research form, which will show me you've done enough preliminary research that you understand the rough outline of your historical story. Now, you're going to turn in that basic research form as a group, but I can also call on any one of you, whether we're back in school or whether we're online on February, on February 19th, I should be able to call on any one of you and say, elevator pitch in your project right now. And what you're going to be able to do is give me a one or two minute summary with the broad outlines of your story expressed with confidence and enthusiasm. Mr. Boyle, I would like to tell you about the murder of Jack Kennedy. And you will tell me about Jack Kennedy's murder, why he was important, where he got killed, what you're doing with it. Okay. Anybody in the group better be able to do that. If you can't, those are going to be quiz grades. Any one of my elevator pitch things is a quiz grade. And if you can't give me the pitch, that's going in as a zero as a quiz grade. So everybody needs to be on the same page with research. Everybody needs to know the topic. Um, so that uh, is the topic research part. Uh, that is due on the 19th of February, 2021. Uh, a couple weeks after that, you are going to identify and locate no less than four primary sources you can use, one of which should be an interview of a witness or an expert. So primary sources include uh, newspapers, photographs, um, recordings, uh, video or sound recordings of, of the event as it happened. Those are all different uh, primary sources. Books that were written by people who were there. So an autobiography by Ella Stewart would be a primary source. Um, a video of the Dempsey Willard fight would be a primary source. Uh, an audio interview with uh, a civil rights pioneer like William Thomas in Toledo would be a primary source. You need to find at least four primary sources. One of them is why you want an investigator on your team. Because the investigator's job is to try and find an expert or someone else who can speak with authority about your topic. Those are due to me by the 26th of February. All right. After that, a couple weeks after that, uh, what, 24 days, I guess about three weeks after that, uh, primary source analysis. By that point, you will have interviewed that person that you uh, set up, the, the interview that you set up, the expert that you identified. Um, you will have interviewed them by the time we're three weeks out from uh, checkpoint four. Um, you will have consulted your other three primary sources. Um, Every member of the group should have individually completed one of the primary source tasks. Uh, if there are four people in the group, then one person should do each primary source. I do not want one person doing all four primary sources. This is how we distribute the workload. Um, and then you will turn in a form as a group that summarizes what you learned from your primary sources. Uh, six is product choice. Now you've done all the research, how are you going to turn this into a historical product? How are you going to turn this into public history? So in this phase, you're going to choose what form your final product is going to take. Um, a museum exhibit. I, I know I crossed it out here, but let's kind of, let's roll with things and see how the world looks in late March. Maybe the vaccine really gets rolled out well, and maybe things are going okay where we can do museum exhibits. So I have it crossed out because I wrote all this in December when things looked really bad. Um, let's... Let's kind of play it by ear there. Uh, a fully formed plan for erecting Ohio historical marker could be something you choose. Professional grade booklet, short documentary film. Um, and again, something else that you think is a good idea that you can convince me is a good idea. Um, choosing what you're going, what form your project is going to take has to be done by March 26th. Now, 
after that is your academic copy draft. This is going to be a narrative about your topic. A narrative is just another word for story. Tell me the story of your topic. All right. Now, it's going to be a minimum of 350 words, max of 600 words. It tells me all the important stuff. Who, what, where, why, when, why do I care? Um, we are building an app for this class, a phone app for this class that will have GPS attached to it. So if people from our city, we're going to make this available to anybody in the city, they can download the app to their phone and then wherever they are in GPS, they can find out what historic sites are close to them. So your group is, you guys as a group, you're probably going to create about a dozen projects this year. Um, and out of those dozen projects, they will show up as pinpoints on a map and people from the community can go and all right i'm going to check this out today i'm going to go to the grave of so-and-so i am going to look at the old fire station number two i'm going to look at the uh the um the dempsey willard fight whatever um they're going to be able to go to these spots and find out cool stuff about toledo history i will also say you guys have the easiest year of this class because i'm not going to let people reuse topics once you guys do a topic it's off the table forever in this class so you guys really have it easier than than the folks who come after you um that academic copy draft will be due to me on april 19th of 2021 that is checkpoint six um and then the full project notice this is in bold your completed product in whatever format you've chosen is due to me with an absolute no excuses no doubt about it, deadline of April 26, 2021. If you are running into problems on April 25th, you need to let me know that night. You don't tell me on the 26th. You tell me on the 25th before 8 o'clock at night, maybe we can work something out if it wasn't something that you could have figured out was a problem beforehand. If you're running into problems in you know, April 8th, 9th, 10th, let me know. We'll work through the problems. We'll get it in by the 26th. Do not come to me on April 26th with nothing. I'm telling you this now. I'm going to tell it to you again live in class. It's on paper here. It's going to be on the parent letter that goes home. No late work can be accepted for the project, period, point blank, bold, underlined, with glowing lights on it. Okay? This is an absolute firm deadline. A lot of you who had me for the World War II class, we were able to we were able to work things together until the last minute. That's not the way this works because with this, again, all hope willing, um, we will be able to do this as a live event. And I can't have you coming in late for the live event. Live event, again, hopefully, um, the Pop-Up Museum will be the week of May 4th. Um, COVID permitting, this will be all of us together in a large space somewhere in the district. Um, with the public invited to roam our museum and learn some of the history you'll teach them. Um, if COVID is still being a jerk, this is going to be a virtual program, but I'm really hoping we'll be able to do this in a field house or a stadium or uh, you know, a main hallway, an auxiliary gym. Like I'm really hoping uh, we'll be able to do the museum live. I really, really, really hope we'll be able to do the museum live. Um, and, you know, that's... It's something we're just going to play by ear for now. So I believe that is everything, folks. I am sorry to have gone on for so long. Um, thank you very much for watching all of this. And remember, you can always watch it again. If you're, uh, if you're in the middle of March and you can't remember what you were supposed to be doing to get started on your academic copy draft, you can always watch this video again and get the answers. So thanks again for watching, everybody. Uh, take care and be well.